Hello, my name is Jeff Messier. I'm a professor in electrical and computer engineering in the Schulich School of Engineering. And this is module 27 in my computer networks lecture series, where we take a look at a campus network design case study. So at this point in the lecture series, we've basically finished talking about the protocol stack. We've started at the bottom, gone all the way to the top. We understand how all the layers work. The rest of our time in this series will be spent on a few assorted topics that kind of look at the network in a way as a whole. So what I wanna do in this particular module is talk about how the University of Calgary has designed its network. And so you can kind of see how the, you know, sometimes generic concepts that we've talked about up until now in the lecture series are applied to a specific situation. The, this case study is also going to be a little bit of a segue into our next topic, which is using queuing theory to analyze the probability of packets dropping within a network and out of that to develop, we're going to develop tools to do things like figuring out how big the buffers need to be in our routers to handle a certain level of traffic. After that, we're going to finish up the lecture series by talking about network security, hacking, and encryption, which is sort of, again, another broad topic that can, um, you know, affects a network as a whole. So to set the stage for this case study, I want to start out by talking just in general about some of the requirements for designing a, a campus network. And, you know, I know there is sometimes the tendency for university students to kind of get tired of, you know, university based examples and kind of hunger for that quote unquote real world experience where maybe we should talk about designing a a network for a, a company or, or, or something like that. But, you know, I, I, I like a campus as a network design example because it is actually an extremely challenging network to design because there are just so many different requirements and different types of users. So, for example, um, a campus network is large. So there are many tens of thousands of network devices on a university campus that need to be plugged in and served in a network. There are also a number of unusual security concerns. So there's a great variety of different types of networks and users within a campus setting. So for example, at the University of Calgary, like most universities, we have you know, computer labs and libraries where, you know, all you really need is a student card to log on to a network machine and then be on the University of Calgary campus network. Also under the broad umbrella of the University of Calgary network is the Foothills Campus Hospital. And, you know, obviously the Foothills Campus is going to have you know, medical records, very sort of sensitive personal information that, you know, would have very limited access and extremely high security requirements. And the network design environment is also very fluid. So users are not always physically located, co-located. So you could have a university research lab where you have people physically in the lab, but also people accessing um, the lab remotely. That lab may require its own dedicated servers and secure environment. And labs are constantly changing. So on a university campus, a researcher might get a research chair, all of a sudden have a bunch of funding, um, want to set up a lab with you know a team of 20 or 30 students and researchers, work very intensely for maybe a five-year period and at the end of the research chair that lab may um, disappear or move or get merged to another lab. So it's, it's a very fluid and, and changing environment. In addition, the University of Calgary and many campuses also are very physically distributed. So in addition to uh, the main campus, 
We also have two remote campus campuses. So we have a downtown campus in downtown Calgary, and we also have the Spy Hill Vet College. And these two sites are you know, many kilometers away from the main campus. So they have to be somehow incorporated into the network as well. And the uh, campus also has a major data center with uh, 1.5 gigabits per second on average um, data traffic that needs to be supported and secured. And of course we need a firewall to kind of protect the overall network from the, from the broader internet. So there's, there's a lot of moving pieces, a lot of different elements. And by looking at how the U of C designs its network, we can really get an appreciation for all the different aspects that you might encounter when designing a network uh, for in, in a more industrial or private sector setting. And so if you'll forgive me for a moment for drawing clouds to represent networks, this is broadly what the University of Calgary network architecture looks like. So in the middle, we have a core network that is responsible for carrying all traffic between all the distinct components of the University of Calgary um, networked communities. So the standard that the UC has chosen to manage its core network is MPLS, which I'm gonna talk about in, in the next slide in, in a little bit of detail. And connected to this core network, we have all the different pieces of the campus that we are required to serve. So we have several building zones connected to the core network. We have the Foothills Hospital connected to the core network, our downtown campus, our Spy Hill Vet College, We've got the data center over here. And of course, all of these pieces have to connect to the broader internet. And so this is kind of the, the large, you know, very high level picture of what the network is like. And it's a pretty common picture. So most major networks will essentially have a, a high speed core network that um, will support you know, most of the, of the traffic moving between the different parts of the network and the different you know, sort of lower speed components, components of the network will plug into that core. And so just a, a word about the MPLS standard. So IP routing, which we've already studied, is based on, you know, looking at an IP address, comparing it to all the entries in our routing table, finding the longest prefix match in our routing table and using that to determine our, the next hop for the IP packet. Back in the day when, when routers were a little bit slower, this was seen as, as kind of an expensive operation. And so there was, an in, um, there was activity around developing different standards that could switch and route slightly faster with a, a slightly simpler addressing scheme. And so there's a few um, standards were developed, asynchronous transfer mode or ATM, multi-protocol label switching or MPLS, and MPLS is the standard that the U of C has chosen to manage its core network. And so basically, um, these high-speed protocols, protocols like MPLS, are designed to be used by a single operator to manage a very high-speed core style network. And essentially, the way it works is you still use IP, but as the IP packets sort of enter the high speed core, they're encapsulated within an MPLS packet. And MPLS packets use labels rather than IP addresses. Labels are a little bit shorter. They don't have to be globally unique across the entire internet. They're just sort of, they need to be unique within their own sort of local high speed network. And that makes them a lot simpler and amenable to higher speed um, switching and routing. Cur you know, in modern times, IP routing is also extremely fast now. So the speed advantage of MPLS is not as significant, but MPLS does allow a lot of other features like, you know, traffic load balancing and a lot of flexibility when creating kind of virtual private networks within the larger core network. So it's chosen basically because it, it offers some flexibility and some speed for managing like a single operator style core network. And so 
you know, as I said, MPLS can basically be used with any other kind of protocol. And, you know, your IP packet or your Ethernet packet is just encapsulated inside an MPLS packet as it moves through the MPLS core. And the routing within an MPLS network is conducted using label switched routers or LSRs. And there are basically two kinds of LSR. One is a provider or P router, which is an LSR that's internal inside the MPLS network. There's also provider edge or PE routers, and those are routers that are basically act as the interface between the MPLS network and whatever network is plugged into it. And customer edge devices or CE devices are the non MPLS devices that plug into the provider edge routers. And so a very simple picture of an MPLS network is something like this. The P routers are the routers that are inside the MPLS network. The provider edge routers, as the name suggests, are on the edge of the network and the PE routers serve as the interface that the customer edge networks um, can plug into. And this is the architecture that, as we're going to see, that's used by the, uh, the UFC network. And so we're going to see provider and provider edge routers inside the UFC core network as well. So this is a more specific diagram representing what the University of Calgary network looks like. In this diagram, all links that I've shown here are 10 gigabit per second ethernet links. And the UFC uses just two P routers and they are basically sort of, they work as kind of a logical pair. They're connected uh, to each other with by direct high speed ethernet links. And they are, uh, Cisco Nexus 7010 switches and these are extremely high speed switches so they're able to switch seven or sorry 5.76 billion packets per second or PPS you can plug up to 64 10 gigabit per second connections into them and you can upgrade these connections to 40 gigabit or 100 gigabit Ethernet links if required and so basically the P, the, this P router pair forms the high speed switching core of the network and essentially all other network devices plug into this P router pair via um, a series of provider edge routers. The provider edge routers also work in logical pairs. They are connected by gigabit ethernet or 10 gigabit ethernet links as well and the PE routers as you would um, expect each PE router has one connection to each P router and the PE routers then connect to the customer edge equipment which are um, devices that we refer to as head end switches and these head end switches are basically the switches that um, are sort of the, the main switch for, you know, different buildings and and um, pr primarily different buildings on campus. And we'll, we'll talk about all of this in a little bit more detail as we move through these slides. This is what, or here's a picture of what the, the Nexus 7010 P routers look like. I don't know if you've ever been inside uh, a server room, but basically kind of everything looks like this all these routers are basically, you know, usually they're, they're black or they're gray, sometimes they're blue, but they're essentially like big racks of equipment where equipment slots kind of with slots for, for big cards to plug into. And these cards are often um, have a bunch of, you know, gigabit uh, or a bunch of ethernet cable ports that you can, you can plug into. So you typically see a lot of cables plugged into these things as well. And as I mentioned, all um, edge networks are connected to the P router pair by pairs, logical pairs of provider edge routers or PE routers. Each PE router pair are interconnected using three 10 gigabit ethernet links. And they sort of act as one sort of logical device. So they, they appear like one switch, but 
Um, they have double the throughput and they also kind of work in a hot standby. So if one switch fails, the other one can continue to operate. And each router, each provider edge router is connected to each of the two um, PE routers in the, in the core. The PE routers are Cisco Catalyst 6509 switches. Their switching speed is a little bit lower than the P routers, as you would expect. Um, rather than billions of packets per second, these switch 400 million packets per second, which is still a lot. And uh, the total system throughput for these switches is two terabits per second that is essentially divided across all of the 10 gigabit per second ethernet links that are, are plugged into these, uh, these devices. And the PE routers take advantage of the fact that they're plugged into both of the provider routers by balance, using a hash function to balance traffic across the, the PE routers. So all of these things that are working in pairs are essentially working to balance the traffic so no one device in a pair is, is overloaded. So regarding you know, how we connect buildings on campus to the core network, the buildings around campus are divided into zones and each zone is served by a single pair of provider edge routers. And there's roughly 26 buildings per zone on campus. And each building has what we refer to as a head end switch. And that's kind of like the master switch for the building all the traffic for a particular building flows through its head end switch. And each head end switch has a connection, one 10 gigabit per second connection to each of the PE routers that connect it to the core network. And these connections are aggregated using the 802.3 AD standard. And so they look just kind of like one logical connection. If we, you know, look within a building, for example, and let, let's take engineering as uh, as an example. Uh, so in engineering, there are about to th there are about three thousand to between three thousand and five thousand network computers connected both to Ethernet and to Wi-Fi. That might, number might be slightly higher now. And uh, as I said, all this traffic goes through the head end switch, and the head end switch that we use at the UFC is the HP ProCurve 5406. And um, this switch has up to 144 ports. So obviously not every machine in the building plugs directly into the head end switch. There are a series of, you know, LANs that fan out from the head end switch. So there are a series of other minor switches distributed throughout the building that the computers plug into. And then those switches in turn plug into the head end switch. Um, the Pro Curve can switch up to 214 million packets per second. So a little bit slower than the provider edge routers and a total aggregate throughput of 288 gigabits per second. Again, a little bit slower than the PE devices. And the Ethernet switching table can accommodate up to 100,000 devices, and the mass maximum buffer size for packets is 180 um, megabytes. And this might be a little bit dated, it, it could be a, a, a bit bigger now, but that's sort of the, the rough ballpark. And um, sometimes people are surprised at how small these buffers are because obviously we can get, you know, very large. Um, you know, hard drives and even the, you know, the RAM on personal computers is um, typically more than this, but it has to do with the fact that this is extremely high speed. Um, these switches have to run at an extremely high speed. So now looking into a little bit more detail about how we connect the core network to the internet, we have one PE router pair, provider edge router pair, dedicated to managing the internet connection. Uh, firewall protection is provided by two FortiGate 3140 firewall units. They've got each 58 gigabits per second uh, capacity. The internet connection itself is provided by a couple of 80 gigabit per second uh, Juniper routing devices. And we have, you know, as most campuses do, the option to connect using external 
virtual private network or VPN technology. And our VPNs are connected or are managed actually with a dedicated piece of, of hardware called a VPN gateway. That's also a FortiGate device. The external, um, our external campuses, you know, the downtown campus and the uh, Spy Hill campus are actually connected to the University of Calgary using directional wireless links, 140 megabit per second directional radio links that have Cisco ASR 1000 routers on either side that provide the um, provider edge MPLS uh, functionality. And as far as our connection to our data center goes, um, the data center has its own PE router pair and the Nexus switches that provide this functionality give us kind of a virtual data center capability where we can sort of create the appearance of several data centers or several sort of, um, you know, unique, unique and autonomous networks within the data center that manage everything from our um, you know internal campus computing and registration system, our payroll systems, the website, um, all that kind of stuff. And the data center also has its own um, firewall capability because of course it has it can house some very sensitive data and we have to even though we're already inside the internal University of Calgary network, um, there has to be security provided for potential attacks that could come from um, internal computers on campus. Uh, 